Hi, my name is John Zekreisi, uh, back here with another segment uh, for our uh, Outdoor Skills Academy. And in this segment, we're going to be talking about a different aspect of ice fishing. Uh, one of the ways I started ice fishing, and I still continue to do it a good, uh, uh, a good amount of the time. Now, we're going to, what we're going to talk about is about using longer rods. Um, you've seen some of the other segments where we're using fairly short rods for ice fishing, and those work uh, very well in most circumstances. But this is something a little different, and we're going to go over some of the, uh, the pluses and minuses of it. Now, I call this long rod fishing. Now, um, when I talk about long rod fishing, what I'm talking about primarily is rods that are going to run from, say, generally three to five feet long. We think of most ice rods are much shorter, um, maybe one foot to even to three feet long. This will talk a little bit about some of the longer ones. Um, and um, the, the usage of these rods are used primarily in waters that are relatively shallow, say uh, up to about 12 feet deep. And that's where they, they, they really shine. Um, and we'll look at some of these. And, uh, this is one of my favorite ones here, but uh, we're going to talk about some of the limitations of these first because nothing is perfect and nothing works every time. Um, these, of course, will not work well in a shelter. This rod here is almost four feet long, and there aren't many shelters that will accommodate a rod of, you know, of this length. Um, these do not work real well in windy conditions simply because of the rod length and the effect of the wind on the rod tip. But, um, uh, and they're a little bit inconvenient to travel with now and then simply because of the length it's not as easy to uh, store them or to travel with them as the shorter rods. But, uh, but like I said, everything has its limitations and I thought I'd touch base on those first. Um, up on the pluses, um, the big plus for these types of rods are they're easy to cover a lot of water relatively fast. Um, you can cover the water column from as shallow as you want to fish up to about 12 feet deep very quickly. Because of the way these, the reach of these rods, and these ceilings in here are about eight feet, and I could reach clear down to the floor, which you won't be able to see, and by raising the rod, I can cover this much of the water column at one time. I, could, I can fish that much of the water column. So if you, if you um, have fish that are stacked up a long ways in the water column, or if you're not sure where the fish are, you can cover that water column very, very easily. Um, that is probably the biggest plus that they have. Um, one of the other biggest pluses are that uh, when you do hook a fish, these rods have, because you don't normally use a reel to reel of fish like you would with a, um, when you're fishing um, tight lining or something like this, you normally just pull the fish up using the rod. Now these rods are quite, they, they give you a lot of forgiveness because they're so long. You can, you can see you can put a real, real strong bend in this rod and this is only two pound test line. So um, they're very, very forgiving when you do hook a fish. And they're relatively easy to land fish. Um, simply, if your fish is going to get in that fairly shallow water, you simply pull up as the fish will, of course, be bending the rod a little bit. And you can lift clear up to here, and you can slide those fish right out of the hole or with the rod, or simply take the line and with your hand as it goes up through your hand and when it gets up to about here you just simply slide the fish right up. Works very nice very easily. Those are a couple of the real pluses. Um, the second or what I guess is probably the third one is that once you do land the fish, you fish land it unhooked, you don't need to um, and I must say disengage your reel or pull out line to get the line back down to where the fish are. You simply take your uh, let go of the lure, you drop it back down the hole, and sink right down to the fish's depth very, very quickly. Well, this can be very important, especially if you have actively feeding fish or actively moving fish, because quite often um, you catch a fish, you pull it up, you take your time on hooking it. By the time you get back down to the, uh, your lure back down where the fish were, they've moved on. So if you get got actively feeding or actively moving fish, this will help you cover that water a whole lot faster and get back down to the now, fish. Now, if you notice, these rods are normally fished with, with a spring bobber. Um, because of the length, they're not practical for uh, um, tight line fishing. But um, we talked about the uh, spring bobbers. Now, if you notice, this spring bobber is basically ends over the tip of the rod, as opposed to this type of spring bobber, 
which goes out past the end of the rod. And one of the reasons it seems to work better on longer rods set up over the tip than out past the end is simply, as you can see, holding this, it tends to bounce around quite a bit. Whereas with the this type of a spring bobber, you don't get anywhere near the bounce. So it's a little easier to, to detect bites in this situation. Um, now, I don't have any here to uh, busily show you, but um, you can use either, you'll see these rods are all rigged up with the, what I call the uh, spring type or the, the, the flat spring, as opposed to sometimes you'll see the little short coil spring coming out of the uh, tip of a rod. Um, and those work well with shorter rods, but with the longer rods, uh, they don't work quite as well. But um, so that's why I prefer these type of springs um, for this type of fishing. Now uh, you can change the length of this spring. Um, these are the same length as you would get from a, you know when, when you buy them in the store. But um, you could actually take and cut these off a little shorter. And what this does, it makes them so they're not quite as sensitive, which will work better in some cases if you're fishing uh, heavier lures and maybe deeper water. But um, for the most part, just your standard length spring bobbers work just fine. Now, if you notice, you look on the end of this tip of this rod. Um, I have my spring tied onto the rod here. And of course, the line goes through, and it goes to another little guide right here. This is simply a fly rod guide that I tie down close to the tip of the rod. And what this does, it keeps the spring from bouncing around quite as much, especially if it's windy. When you have a little bit of a weight on it, it won't, it won't move nearly as much. Now, for an example, if we were to take this spring bobber and If you notice, that spring tends to bounce around a little more. But with that extra guide about here, it dampens that bounce quite a bit. It makes it much, much easier to detect uh, the fish uh, when they hit the lure. Now, um, we'll look at some of the different, different types of spring bobbers now, or the different types of setup. This is Again, one I put together. This is the same basic cut, but this was this is simply the tip off an old uh, spinning rod that I made this many, many, many years ago when I saw the first person I ever watched fish with a spring bobber, um, and I thought that's really a good idea. Um, and so I started fishing with a spring bobber, and I've gone through several different scenarios as how I set these up. This is what I landed on, and. This little spring up here, this little guide up here by the tip of the rod, it's not my idea. It's something I picked up from a fellow I saw fishing on another lake. Um, and he was using a rod that was about six feet long, which in my estimation is almost too long and that it's just too hard to control. So I prefer the ones that are in the three to four foot range. But that's um, that the spring here. Now, when we talk about strings and we talk about, about guides. Now, this is a standard schoolie. Uh, schoolie rod and schoolie reel set up. You can buy it almost any of the sporting goods stores. They'll run you somewhere from about ten to twenty dollars, depending on the uh, on the length of the rod and whatnot. But if you notice, um, you have one guide here, and you have one guide here. That's the only guide you have on the rod. Now, um, what I've done, of course, is I've eliminated most the guides that I, I put my own guides on. But um, as you can, if, I don't know if you can see this or not, with this line when you flex the rod, you can see the the way the uh, line runs from guide to guide. It just, it doesn't follow the curve of the rod very well. And these work just fine, but of course, as a tackle tinkerer, we always have to keep messing with things. But on this rod, if you can see there are three guides there, and the line will follow the rod a whole lot better. Um, it just seems to work better for me anyway. And this, again, this is the same situation. Um, this line you probably won't be able to see, but again, it, this works the same. You get a nice even bend in the rod, very flexible, and this is where that uh, flex comes into play when you're fighting when you're fighting a fish. 
Now, um, when you're putting a, a, um, springs on the rod, this rod comes with a uh, spring that is actually clipped on the rod, and you'll find many of the rod setups that have these types of spring bobbers with this type of a setup. Um, I'm not real crazy about those. Um, this one I think is probably actually has a bit of a glue on it so it holds it in place, but quite often these will slip. Um, and you also will see some of the springs that uh, they have a little rubber attachment that fits right in the end of your, your, your tip top. Uh, those I don't cover either so much because they tend to come off and I've never had very good luck with them. But um, uh, this one has the clip on style. And, but what I do with mine is I put my guides on, I wrap them on just as if you would a guide on any of the rods. I uh, get it in place where I want it, kind of secure it with a piece of masking tape, and then I wrap the um, spring on just as if you would a guide. Now if you're wondering about how to wrap guides, or how to wrap a guide, or how to wrap a spring on, you can go online, um, and I'm sure there's any number of videos that will show you how to attach a guide to a rod, and it's, it's the same basic process. And you use most any kind of thread. Um, uh, if you can get, you know, rod winding thread is the best. But most any kind of thread will work. And then when I get done winding it on, I put on a coat of uh, fingernail polish. Or a couple of coats of fingernail polish. And this usually keeps it good for several years of fishing. Um, and if you put... Um, a fair number of guides on the rod, like I said, this one has three, my other one there has, has four. Um, you'd think you tend to have guides that would ice up when you're fishing, but you don't normally have much of issue with these guides icing up, simply because you're not reading the length of the guides when you, uh, handle, uh, when you hook a fish. You're simply pulling it out and, um, and therefore you're not using the, the, uh, the guides. Now, the reels I prefer for these are simply these schoolie reels. They're about five dollars at most of your sporting goods stores. And they come with a built-in spring right in here, which acts kind of as a drag. Because occasionally when you're fishing, you'll hook a large fish. Um, say you could hook a very large panfish, or quite often you'll hook a bass, maybe a walleye, maybe even a pike. Um, and with these springs on these reels, it's very simply, very easy for the fish to pull the line out. It acts simply as a drag. And of course then you can fight the fish just almost like it was a regular reel. Now what I do when I'm, when I'm fishing, um, I keep this relatively loose. So if I do hook a good fish, they can pull out the line. But I just simply fish with my thumb on the reel. So when I go to set the hook, the reel doesn't slip. But yet, if, yet if you get a really, really large fish that pulls hard, you'll be able to pull it out. And then you simply fight the fish like you would have with a with a reel. It's kind of fun to hook about a three pound bass on one of these rods with two pound test line, and you can land them more often than not. So, uh, just another little uh, fun thing about these long rods. But that's pretty much all the information we have on these longer rods. And uh, if you come to the class, we'll be able to talk about these and um, maybe go over them a little bit. But it's just another arsenal in the ice fisherman's tackle box. So you guys have made your purchase, uh, rod and reel combo, now it's time to select a type of line. Now the line selection is going to determine what type of fishing you're going to do. Now you can set your rods and reels up for just a variety of different types of fishing. Most people don't do that. Norman Terry Smith, they prefer high fizz, two, three pound test, yellow strand line. You know, that's just their go-to line. Where I like a braided line because you can feel the sensitivity in that a little bit better. And also, I run swivels on all my systems, so I'm just fishing a, a leader line. So depending on the types of lines you want, there's braided lines, there's mono, and there's fluorocarbon lines. Um, start with the braided lines. Uh, I use this Ice Frost line by Clam. That's what I have on this reel right here. It's a high-vis uh, chartreuse line, and I'm running seven-pound test. Now, why seven-pound test for bluegills? Well. As you guys will see here, if you guys can see it anyway, or you'll see out on the ice, I have a little tiny swivel tied to my braided line, and then I have a leader line of fluorocarbon. So I have a two pound test fluorocarbon tied to my seven pound test braid, 
The nice part about this braid is a bigger fish, crappies, bluegills, whatever it may be, it pulls against the side of the ice. So you want to try to keep it centered so they don't do that, but eventually it wears on the line. And using this braided line, it's not going to fray or put nicks into the line when I get it caught into the ice or it's going against the side of the hole. I can fish all day. If I want to switch over to fishing for walleyes or anything else, all I got to do is switch out my leader line and I can go to a little bit heavier line. Especially when I'm fishing for bigger crappies, I like to go to a four pound test. So the night before, all I got to do is cut off that little bit, retie on four pound test and I'm good to go. So that's the way I like to set up my rod. So typically I'm setting them up with right around a six pound test braid and then I run it down to a barrel swivel and then I'm running a fluorocarbon or a mono depending on what type of fishing I'm doing and I run my systems that way. Now if you guys want to go do some dead sticking um, you're not going to be jigging a lot with that rod. You can put a straight mono that's what these have on there. I just haven't bought braided line for all of my reels. Um, braided line can get expensive really quick if you guys fish you already know that. So over time I'll probably switch these out but if all you want to do is put mono on. I do highly recommend a high vis line, and I'll show you a picture here. Because the high vis line will give you two things. If you want a tight line, you can see it. If you need to retie out on the ice, you can see it. And as it gets dark in your shanty, or as it gets darker out and you want to do some night fishing, you can click on your UV light and that line will pop. And you can still tight line in the dark without having to use a flashlight and see what you're doing. So those are the different types of line. So when you guys go up, go up to the register, purchase the line, or ask the guy at the counter, and typically the associates may uh, help you spool your reels, or you can take it home and spool them yourself. Uh, the way I do that is I like to walk out 50 feet of line, or 50 yards of line, and then I cut it, and then I just reel it back on the reel and that takes all the twist out of the line. That's the way I like to do it. Just walk out 50 yards, cut it, and you're good to go. Reel it right onto your reel. Um, a granny knot is sufficient because if a fish uh, peels off all the line, you're probably not going to stop them uh, when it gets to the end anyway. So if you guys have any questions, write them down. I can talk about different varieties of line. But to reinforce what we're looking at, uh, rather than running a straight two to four pound test, high vis, yellow, or chartreuse line, or I'm running a braided line down to a um, leader line, and that's the way I've got my two bluegill rods set up and my dead sticks. I'm just running a straight mono, uh, eight pound test down to a six pound test leader fluorocarbon line. So you guys have any questions please ask I'm gonna go over how to rig your rods for perch walleye uh, bluegills and crappie in the species specific session sessions so if you guys have any questions let me know